that was the constant position of Egypt fr uh, since the very beginning. The president gave some clear-cut messages uh, about Egypt's position towards the Palestinian uh, cause, where he said that Egypt has put the uh, Palestinian cause in the forefront, and Egypt was uh, one of the first to support uh, Palestine. Uh, he called on the international community to uh, uh, address the humanitarian needs and called for the delivery of the humanitarian aid and fuel uh, as uh, much as possible. He also uh, asserted that the Rafah crossing was never closed from the Egyptian side, despite that it was being uh, uh, or that it was shelled four uh, times. The president was speaking very clearly with very clear messages during uh, today's uh, event. Uh, that came a day after reaching a truce or a uh, Hamas-Israel uh, uh, truce that was agreed upon uh, the uh, mediation of Egypt, Qatar and the United States. And it was uh, originally scheduled to take place on Thursday, but it was postponed for what the Palestinian officials said, uh, a result of last minute discussion regarding names of Israeli captives and the specifics of the release. We'll be speaking about, uh, or rather we'll be reading into the messages of the president uh, today, these very clear-cut messages that were given uh, today. We'll be speaking also about the developments uh, in the uh, Gaza uh, scene, and we'll be speaking about this truce and how important it is. We'll be speaking about that. First, let's have this report. And the president attends this Long Live Egypt conference in support of Gaza. Abdel Fattah Sisi attended a conference entitled Long Live Egypt Palestine, which was held at Cairo International Stadium on Thursday. Addressing the attendees, President Sisi said that the Arab region is facing difficult challenges and serious escalation in the Palestinian cause. The president affirmed that Egypt has exerted great efforts in supporting Palestinians during the escalation in Gaza Strip and intensified connections with its regional and international partners during past days. The head of state further stressed that Egypt would never agree on forcing displacement for Gazans and asserted its constant supportive stance towards Palestinian cause. The head of state also said that Egypt would never close Rafah crossing before conveying humanitarian aid to Gaza and pointed out that more than 75% of the total humanitarian aid reaching Gaza was provided through the border. The president also reiterated that Egypt received lists of hostages and prisoners who will be released on the first day of Gaza truce. The conference, which was also attended by public and celebrity figures, came in conjunction with the current developments in Gaza Strip and in solidarity with the Palestinian cause. Earlier on Wednesday, President Sisi welcomed the humanitarian truce in Gaza, which was announced for four days and mediated by Egyptian Qatar U.S. efforts. The president also wrote on his official page on the social media that he also welcomed the planned exchange of hostages for prisoners held in Israeli jails. The head of state further rejected a new, any attempts to liquidate the Palestinian cause. Right, welcome back. And before we delve into our discussion, let's first have a quick look on the top stories of the day. And President Abdel Fattah Sisi received on Thursday a phone call from U.S. President Joe Biden, the fourth in a row. Presidential spokesman Consular Ahmed Fahmi said that during their call, the two presidents underscored the robust and firm strategic partnership between Egypt and the United States and confirmed commitment to further advancing it across all areas. As to the situation in the region, the U.S. president was keen on extending gratitude to President de Sisi for Egypt's role in the joint mediation that resulted in a humanitarian truce in the Gaza Strip. President, or rather U.S. president, valued the Egyptian efforts to enhance regional security and stability and emphasized the United States' categorical rejection of the forced displacement of the Palestinians from Gaza to the Egyptian territories. President Sisi pointed out that the Egyptian efforts emanate from Egypt's keenness on ending the bloodshed and achieving stability in the region. 
The president underlined the necessity to leverage the current humanitarian truce to reach a lasting ceasefire and deliver the necessary quantities of relief, aid and fuel to all areas in the enclave. The two presidents also affirmed the vital need to work towards a political settlement through the Palestinian issue based on the two-state solution. Concluding their call, President Sisi and President Biden agreed to continue coordination and consultation between the two sides so as to capitalize on the current truce to reinforce security and stability in the region. Right, and uh, in his speech to the G20 leaders, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi said that the silence is no longer an option in the face of the crises that have erupted and waiting and waiting is no longer a solution to confront possible global scenarios geopolitically and economically. The president said that we do not have the luxury of postponing action and confrontation, stressing that challenges impose themselves and extend and expand and intertwine. He added that there is no substitute for a stance for honesty with oneself in which we judge the human conscience and the values of justice, fairness and objectivity and common interests and with what enables us to overcome the current serious crises and launch development efforts to achieve security towards a better future for all humanity at large. Right, welcome back and delving into our discussion, let me first welcome our uh, distinguished guest, His Excellency Ambassador Midhat al former Assistant Foreign Minister. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, um, let's start with what we have just uh, seen, this report, the Long Live Egypt uh, conference, attended today by President Sisi and addressed by the President, in which he addressed not only the nation, but it was statements to the whole world. Let me take you reading to this, his statements. Well, exactly, as you mentioned, and actually it was like an escalation in the tone of the speeches of His Excellency the President. I mean, we've seen him talking to uh, the BRICS at the, with, the, with the, 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 the conference that was with the head of, of nations of the BRICS the countries and as well as the G20 and finally today his, his speech with uh, Long Live Egypt. I think today's message was the sharpest one and the clearer one of all of them. Uh, the message was very clear that uh, he, as someone who voted from the beginning to peace in the region, is finding hard obstacles to achieve that goal with the continuum of escalation of the war machine of Israel. And it was clear in his messages that was not at all sugar-coated in any way and he, he made it clear that Egypt and him personally, that's, that's how I felt, that him personally was feeling that this situation cannot continue like that forever and that he has reached a certain level of uh, self-control that beyond it will not be sustained. He cannot take it anymore. And I think that this is due to the uh, atrocities committed by the Israelis. At, at a certain point, he even mentioned that these are, ca cannot just go as war. This is beyond war. And uh, this means that what Israel is committing reached the level of war crimes. That's what I can read out uh, of this. Uh, actually, uh, according to the president, he said that the killing machine gun went without a guiding mind and did not differentiate between a child, a, a woman, woman or an or old, old man, man person, exactly. with no conscience, mind becoming a disgrace, a, a, a real disgrace Please, for humanity. humanity. Exactly, oh. exactly my point. The, the president feels that the situation has gone a little bit out of control. As I mentioned before a few weeks ago on this same show, I said that there is kind of vendetta. It's becoming a, a vengeance machine and it does not stop at a certain limitation or any point. I mean, it's becoming, uh, in the Israeli mind, okay to kill as many Palestinians as possible as long as this will annihilate the, the presence of Hamas, which so far we haven't seen that happening. Exactly. And, and this, exactly. Is the, this is the real problem, that Hamas is still, I think, as strong, if not stronger than before. They are getting more and more support 
from the international attendance because we are seeing a lot of demonstrations all over the world because Hamas is mixed inside the, 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 the Palestinian. And we haven't heard so far, and this is a very important issue, that we haven't heard any Palestinian blaming Hamas for what's going on today. All the blame goes to Israel because Israel is shooting all over the place without any, just like the president mentioned, and you just read it now, I mean, without any kind of discrimination, they are shooting everything that moves. While inside the scene, you cannot judge really what's going on, and you just see who's hitting you hard and who's killing you. You can't see uh, that, who, why the reasons, but what the death happened. But can just tell you what you're doing. Yes. We are, we are reaching almost 15,000 yes, today. Yes, indeed, indeed. And uh, over, over 12, 30, I think, uh, wounded and uh, not to mention the number of children and women. It's quite obvious that this killing machine doesn't see exactly where it's shooting at. And this is the real danger of the situation because the world cannot uh, stand and wait for something further to happen. We've seen many parliamentarians in the European Union talking about what more do Europe need to stop this and ask and, and, and request a ceasefire from the Israelis because the, the pictures that have been, uh, have been shown everywhere d demonstrates the need of a ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire right now. Before I go to this and before I go to the, the international community's response so far, I have here to say that for the very first time there was a very clear-cut message of a red line. Before we spoke about uh, that we categorically reject the displacement of uh, Palestinians, we uh, reject uh, the liquidation of the Palestinian cause. No, today there was red line. The displacement of Palestinians is a red line. What does this mean diplomatically? Well, I, I, I don't want actually to, to, to take it this way. I, I totally agree with you that there was a sharp tone today. But let's not forget that the president from day one mentioned that this was not an option. And I remember also that he have said, and maybe a few weeks ago, he said not even within Gaza. So the, the, the Egyptian president was very clear that the displacement of Palestinians is not acceptable, whether in or out. And Whether the re relocation, the uh, transfer, exactly. and definitely and the And today he even mentioned both countries. He mentioned oh. Egypt and Jordan. Yes. And, and this was mentioned before by uh, the king of Jordan himself. That he said, not Jordan, not in Egypt. And all this aims to do one thing, is to uh, the liquidation of the Palestinian uh, cause. And I think this was the red line, that we will not accept the liquidation uh, of the Palestinian cause. There is another word that I see very important, that the president did not just say this is for the sake of Palestinians, as, as much as he said this is also for the national security of Egypt. Indeed. Indeed. And this was a very important message that the Palestinian on our border is a buffer zone in a way. And that's why we don't want this buffer zone to be demolished. It has to stay there because this is their land, they have to be on their land, and we know how to deal with them each in his own territory. And the idea of reoccupying uh, Gaza once again is not acceptable according to what, what, what the President has said. But let me add something here because you mentioned earlier the call of President Biden. And I think that Honestly, I have to say the no, truth no, here. No, no, but before we move to President Biden, because this is the fourth time and we have seen totally different tones during the four calls and uh, uh, from the previous position, but, but, but before we go into that, because you mentioned or you pinpointed your finger on a very important point that the, the President spoke about, which is the national security of Egypt and the national security of the region, because he collectively said, our states. Uh, uh, here the president said clearly that Egypt is not or has not been working for not further escalation because of weakness but rather 
but rather for not inflaming the situation more. And that indeed we are very much uh, uh, capable of protecting our, own national, our national security. How do you read that statement and uh, um, um, how do you think all involved parties read that? Well, first of all, my main concern is the Egyptian public and the Egyptian. And, and that's Egyptians. another uh, uh, issue that we'll speak at the end of this or a conclusion to what well, the president said. I, I want to start the, with the Egyptians because actually at the end of the day, the president is the president of Egypt and he has to reassure and reconfirm our position regarding this issue. And it was important for him to, uh, to speak to his own people to make them understand that our position did not budge. We did not change our position on the contrary. It's becoming more firm and more clear to everybody in the world. Uh, let's not forget that there were many calls from Israel to uh, displace the Palestinian into Gaza, into, sorry, into, into uh, Sinai, and not even Sinai, some, some even went all the way and said into Egypt at large. Mm. And, uh, and, and our answer was always from the beginning a very good one. And uh, we, we precise that this is not acceptable, because, not just because it's, it, it's temporary or, or, or permanent, because this is against the human rights and uh, the human rights and against the international law, which is something the president uh, like to observe in everything he says, that it has to be in convention with the human rights and with the international law. But today, the clear message was that this is not an option at all. It was never on the table. It will never be on the table. It's not even there to be discussed in any way or form. Mm. And this was important for us as Egyptians to hear this message once again from our president. But let's not forget something. We didn't hear one call, one call from the Palestinians that they want to go or move to Sinai in any way, not even temporary. All that they have asked for is a ceasefire on their land. I don't think in any, in any news we heard that Palestinians are calling for Egypt to open its borders so that they can move in. There was just a, 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 a hint by uh, once I'm by Ismail Haney. Officially Hane, speaking, but, but, officially but, but, speaking yes, this indeed. was never a case. This was never open. This was never discussed as an option. Yes. So I think that it was I, not have, on to, the I have to give the credit also to the Palestinian who, although all the massacres that they are facing, yes, they did not call for this. If you see yesterday the news, and if you see the demonstrations in the streets of Gaza, having known that there would be a truce, they were all supporting what happened, and they were thanking the Palestinian resistance for reaching that, which is the truce. In, in, in other way, I mean, they should be more or less what I expected or, or other observers expected that they will be sad that the situation after all this death toll that is extremely high they will not have the time to rejoice but actually no they they know that this is something in their in their well-being they thanked Egypt uh, they thanked even the United States for its involvement but once again we can see that they feel some kind of victorious and this actually scares me a bit because the Israeli once they feel that they did not achieve what they want to achieve maybe after the four days everything will go back to where it was yesterday which is something we hope it will not happen actually as the president was giving the uh, go-ahead or the launching of this com or these convoys uh, prepared by uh, by the Egyptian civil society and the Long of Egypt and, and uh, the National Alliance and all this, um, um, the President said something very important, that what had happened before is something and what is coming is a real serious juncture. How did you read that? Well, as, as several observers mentioned this before, and even the Israeli side, that before the 7th of October is going to be totally different from after the 7th of October. Our reading 
to that is that we have to sit and negotiate peace and long-lasting peace mm. in the region. I think the Israeli reading of, of, of such a notion is that we have to totally eliminate Hamas and we have to continue until Hamas no longer exists and cease to be in the picture, which is impossible actually. And the idea of continuing these massacres will actually on the long run create more of Hamas type. I mean, we can, you, can, you can name it other names, but it will still be the same, the same logic, which is to defend ourselves and to combat the occupation. And I mean, it's quite obvious that to every action there is a reaction. And as long as there is occupation, there will be Palestinian resistance. So the idea is not to create more bloodshed, but to minimize this so that we can have someone to talk to to end this, it's not it's not beneficial for, beneficial for the for the Israeli side as well. They cannot live like that. See what happening happening in the street of Tel Aviv and Haifa. I mean, there are a lot of demonstration against the prime minister, against the government, against the policies that led to this. There is this trend worldwide going on, not just on social media, which is ceasefire in Gaza now. It is a well, it's it's going viral. Well. Actually, this in the whole world, in, in the world you can find, but in yes. Israel it's different. In Israel they want another government that is capable on achieving peace and at the same time securing its border. Indeed, Israelis are scared. What happened the 7th of November of October was not something simple, and hence came the truce, which we have seen President Sisi and King Abdullah sitting together in order to discuss how. They can, we can work for reaching a permanent ceasefire in Gaza uh, in order to be able to prepare the situation for a lasting peace. Before we move on with uh, uh, our uh, discussion and uh, before we continue on, let's have this quick report. And President Sisi and Jordan's King Abdullah call for reaching permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Let's watch. President Abdel Fattah Sisi and Jordan's King Abdullah II reaffirmed the importance of continuing efforts to achieve a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. El Sisi and King Abdullah also emphasized the need to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian aid in line with international consensus reflected in the relevant resolutions of the United Nations Security Council and General Assembly. Both leaders also reiterated their outright rejection of any attempts to displace Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, either internally or externally. President el-Sisi and King Abdullah underscored that stability in the region should be pursued through a comprehensive political process aimed at achieving a just resolution to the Palestinian issue through a two-state solution. This resolution includes the legitimate rights of the Palestinians with a key focus on the establishment of an independent Palestinian state with its capital in East Jerusalem. Additionally, the two leaders reviewed the joint efforts of both countries to engage with all parties expressing the necessity for the international community to leverage the current truce to alleviate the suffering of the people in Gaza and address the humanitarian crisis in the region. The Palestinians' death toll in the Gaza Strip has reached 14,128 since the war began on October 7th, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry's report on Tuesday. On Tuesday, during a parliamentary session, Egyptian Prime Minister Mustafa Madbouli affirmed Egypt's strong opposition to the forced displacement of Palestinians to Sinai despite economic and political pressures. Welcome back, and indeed, yes, uh, we've all heard the Prime Minister and also the Parliament Speaker. And I guess the President uh, reiterated uh, today uh, uh, what uh, they were speaking about, and uh, the President said today clearly that we pledge together that the unity of Egyptians would remain the guarantor for Egypt's survival. Indeed. Indeed. 
we are all in support of decisions made, made by the leadership. And back to you, Your Excellency, and we were speaking about the US president. Yes. Getting back to that. And the difference, or the difference in the position since the very be beginning and recently. Well, as you just mentioned, that the tone of President Biden have changed a little bit since the beginning, where the only thing he said was the unconditional uh, right of Israel to defend itself, to now that he is supporting most of what we are saying, actually. I mean, we have to remember what he said. First of all, he spoke about the two-state solution and spoke about the necessity to sit for peace. And that there is, uh, there is international law that has to be observed, which is in a certain way between brackets that Israel is not actually really committed to that. And fourth point and most important is that he, he showed that he is not going to accept the continuation of this forever. Of course, there are two reasons behind that, two major reasons behind that. The first one is that the American elections are approaching and the president needs to be a little bit more devoted to that so that he can convince the American people to re-elect him. Uh, not to mention that he has to take part in any achievement that will happen in the Middle East as he was the one behind it, which will help him dramatically in the election. The second thing is that there is a pressure, internal pressure in the United States. We've seen the big marches and demonstrations among the American people who are not in support of Israel anymore as they used to be unconditionally. The scene has changed inside the streets in the United States. It's totally different than what we have seen before. For the very first time, this face that they have never seen or some of their generations have never been it acquainted was just with? small voices. Now we are talking about masses talking in the same direction. Mm. And this is unprecedented. We are seeing famous and, 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 and large newspapers such as the Washington Post and New York CNN and CNN they are all I cannot say they are in favor but at least they are sympathizing with what with what's going on and I think this is a major change in the American policy and it will affect it in the future but having said that it's very important for me and for any observer in the Middle East and especially for the Palestinian that this these words would be translated into real pressure on Israel because at the end of the day what does it mean to support the two-state solution if you are not going to work for it? We have two major players in the two-state solution, which is the Palestinians and the Israelis. The Palestinians, I'm sure that they are okay with the plan of having a two-state solution. But what about the Israelis? Are they really convinced? I have to say that many Israelis are saying that Israel was never serious about the two-state solution. That's why they kept building settlements and expanding them day after day. How come they invest so many billions into creating those settlements to leave them one day and to give, them, to give this land to the Palestinian? And, and, and that's why I am not very much optimistic about the Israeli position regarding the two-state solution. Are they really serious about having a two-state solution? One of the uh, counselors of Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, a few days ago, being asked on CNN about the two-state solution, he kept avoiding the answer. He doesn't want to answer the question if Israel is really supporting the two-state solution, which actually shed some darkness on the real position of Israel regarding the two-state solution. So, the whole world is talking about it, but the most important party is trying not to talk about it and to avoid answering to that point. Is Israel really serious about a two-state solution? If yes, what are they, their plans to establish the second state. Definitely, definitely, it, it would take some good time and discussions and uh, lots of efforts for Israel to realize that its existence in the first place 
needs that solution. And this is why we, 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 we get back to the truce, the uh, Egypt, Qatar, US mediated uh, yes. truce. And why this truce has to endure for sometimes why it has to be permanent until preparing the ground for the uh, for, for for negotiations or for for for, uh, for ideas to come. Uh, here we we have to speak on several sectors. I mean here the situation in Israel, the international communities uh, realizing things ongoing some geopolitical changes and alliances that are reshaping. Some of the countries who were not very much into the scene, but they are just watching in confusion, uh, or the confusion of what's going uh, uh, on and how the story will, would unfold. And here I'm speaking about, of course, Russia and China. Uh, let me here take how you see all sectors and the circumstances and why would this truce or the roadmap Egypt has put depending on the definitely the Arab initiative and 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 all the international laws and resolutions and uh, and UN resolutions and all this uh, uh, why is it inevitable it's not anymore uh, it cannot be avoided. Impo anyway. Yes, yes, it's inevitable, well, by all means. The, 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 the situation is the following. First of all, we have a serious humanitarian crisis. And according to me, nobody is able to control what's going on. The war machine, as the president called it himself. I mean, we we've, we've have spoken earlier about the United Nations and the role of the United Nations. but. Excuse me, I mean, the United Nations lost over 100 of its personnel in the UNRWA. Could they do anything about that? They couldn't. I mean, 100 personnel who belongs to the United Nations, yes. that's a huge death toll concerning who they represent. They represent the world community, the United Nations. All the nations of those people, do they see that? Do, 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 are they aware of, of, of... Do we talk about it enough as we talk about other elements? We don't. All of us. This is, this is a, major, a major problem because Israelis are doing what they want, even to the United Nations, and nobody dares to talk about it's it. Out, these are it's outlaw. outrageous. No, it's, it's outlaw. It's outlaw. It's, it's out all international well, laws. Well, we, are, we, we, are, we always have confirm together that what's happening is our clue. So I mean, it's not just this, but I'm talking here about this is the, what represent the international community. Mm -hmm. And yet the United Nations couldn't do anything. I have seen a couple of days ago, the Secretary General of the United Nations warning those dead uh, employees of his organization. And yet, and, and, and that was it. I mean, there was, not, there was no more repercussions by the United Nations against Israel. But this is a, a side, beside the point. When we talk about the truce now, the truce was inevitable, as you mentioned, for the simple reason that the casualties are too high. And the, the number of, of, of trucks and um, the tons of humanitarian aid is not sufficient. So far, uh, we, we entered around 12,000 tons mm. of humanitarian aid which, and this, I, I care about saying this because in front of the whole world, the world has to know, over 70% of these 12,000 tons of humanitarian aid that we managed to enter were from Egypt. So the rest of the world contributed only with 30% to the Palestinian. And this is something that we have to mention so the world would know the contribution. We even opened Darish airport so that yes. we can receive Indeed. any donations given by anyone. But I think it was a little bit less than what it was supposed to be. Egypt was not supposed to be alone giving 70%, not because it's adjacent country, so that's the, that's the toll should fall on us all the time. The world who have seen the crisis should have contributed more. But unfortunately, we haven't seen this, especially from the Western countries who contributed. I am not denying what they did, but not enough. 
they, they should have been at least 10 times more of what they contributed so far. Anyway, the truth is important because now we can enter more trucks into the, into the, the Gaza Strip with more assistance, medical, humanitarian, and food supply, and water, drinkable water, fuel, and fuel, and everything. Let's not forget that Israel will be controlling everything that enters. And uh, again, Israel is in control of what enters because it's an occupation country. So it controls what happens because uh, the idea of saying that the border was closed, no, the border when it's closed, it's closed from the other side, not from the Egyptian side. The Egyptian side was never closed. So whoever can get out of there, we receive. And whatever, uh, as we received before, the double nationalities who came out through this. And all the injured. And, and, and all the and, injured and, and, and all these. And, this and, was with, with, of course, acceptance of and the... Amputees and, 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 the, and, the, and exactly. babies. And, and so the OK came from the Israeli government. And they made babies. a check on each and every one of them to allow them to go out. Maybe he is wanted from Hamas or any other organization. And they wouldn't allow him or her to go out. So the idea that we are the sole controller of this border is a false image that wants to put in people's mind, in the international community's mind, that it's Egypt responsible for not delivering aid, which I think the president was very clear today about the number of uh, trucks being able to go inside Gaza was very limited, according to the president, due to the other side not responding and accepting the entrance of these trucks. I have only one minute left for me here and I need to come to a, con uh, a conclusion. Yes. What should be the message right now and, 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 and clearly? The message is that Egypt welcomes any effort that will enable us to sit on a negotiation table and talk about uh, a peace. But as I mentioned earlier, do we have a political will from the Israeli side to do that? Or do they need more dead people before they sit to this negotiation? Because eventually they have to negotiate with the Palestinians in order to establish the two-state solution, the only solution accepted by all the world and the world community. So is Israel willing to sit down and to negotiate or not? So the right question would be, would the international community stop giving Israel the, the green light? And are they really... Uh, it's a little uh, bit more than just a green light. It's about weapons, it's about, uh, it's about political everything. support. Then it's the about will. what we are seeing Indeed. in the last few weeks. Indeed. Indeed. And that's a big question mark that has to be raised. How would that be to the whole world, from your point of view? Well. The whole world knows our position, and they have their own position that they have translated. But the idea is that when you say something, do it. The Europeans, the Americans, all of them spoke about the two-state solution. What are you really doing in order to achieve this? What kind of pressure do you put on Israel in order to force them to sit and negotiate? Right. This is the reality of things, not just the good words. As I mentioned before with President Biden, mm -hmm. what he said was very Indeed. much close to our position. But then what? What will you do to deeds. achieve that? Deeds. We need deeds. Your Excellency Ambassador uh, Mithat Nigi, former Assistant Foreign Minister, thank you so much for being with us tonight and for your input as usual. And uh, I guess uh, that uh, takes us to the end of this episode. Remains to be seen. The truth starts tomorrow, 7 in the morning. So hopefully, hopefully it would endure. Many thanks for watching. It is time for the early top stories. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi attended a conference entitled Long Live Egypt, Palestine, which was held at Cairo International Stadium, addressing the attendees.
President Assisi said that the Arab region was facing difficult challenges and serious escalation in the Palestinian cause, affirming that Egypt had exerted the utmost efforts in supporting the Palestinians and intensified communications with the regional and the international partners during the past days. The head of state further stressed that Egypt would never agree on forcing displacement for the people of Gaza and asserted that Egypt would never close the Rafah crossing for convoying the humanitarian aid to Gaza as more than 75% of the total humanitarian aid was provided through the border.